And the new academic street is going to really open up level four of the city campus. It will create new laneways, it will create open space, it will create collaborative learning space and quite a significant amount of social space. It will also enable students to move freely from building 80 across Swanson Street into the new academic street developed area. Supporting that will be the development of areas such as a new media precinct which will enable students to work in all aspects of media in relation to RMIT. This project is not just about bricks and mortar, it is a tangible investment in providing the best possible experience for our students now and into the future. We're very excited about the new Academic Street project for our students. Our students will be able to get far better infrastructure from what they've had. Some of the buildings are rather tired, they turn away from Swanson Street. The new Academic Street project will make that far better. The library space will be increased to 2,000 spaces where currently there's only 1,000. The new student hall will provide a one-stop shop to students rather than them having to queue for long periods in different locations. And thirdly, far better access through to the city and places for students to hang out, which our students say they greatly value. The incredible thing about the new Academic Street Project is that it will build these really powerful connections between the city and the centre of the campus because at the moment it's pretty much a barricade on Swanson Street with the grey building so the project will really open up connections for students to be able to get to the heart of the campus uh, and in doing so you actually build the experience for students that RMIT is like being part of the city and a very urban experience. For the new Academic Street it's a really innovative collaboration between five different architectural design practices, in fact all of whom are RMIT alumni and the idea of that is that we get this sense of diversity in the architecture so that, that actually builds for students a sense of choice and diverse experience as part of the idea of RMIT being a city-based campus. So we've been working on the project now for three and a half years and now it's moving into the exciting phase which is the construction and it's going to be delivered in three phases. By the start of 2016 there's going to be some great new student space uh, on the upper levels of the building and then after that there's going to be two more phases of delivering the project before the final our project is complete and available. We have a number of initiatives that we've introduced to reduce the disruption on both staff and students during the NAS project. We have established the NAS Project Management Office. It's responsible for the overall change involved with NAS. It's also responsible for the communication strategy to make sure that staff and students feel that they're being communicated with and know how the change is going to affect them directly. We've also got a rules of engagement document. It's designed to reduce the disruption during working hours. We've also focused on the health and safety aspects of the project, making sure that we've got increased resources and processes for people to report incidents and hazards, making sure that we provide a safe environment for staff and students during this change. If you need any help or information at all, there's two great places to go to. Firstly, the NAS website, and secondly, call HR Assist directly. There's a lot of energy around the new Academic Street project. We're really excited about the great new spaces to come, the additional microwaves and power outlets, retailers that will cater for a diverse range of dietary requirements and tastes. We're also excited about the bar to come. I'm really excited about the new Academic Street project because it creates a new environment for students at RMIT. We'll be in a world-class facility it's going to provide opportunities for students and staff to showcase what we do at RMIT and it will create a learning environment where students can really excel. Okay, well, welcome everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, New Academic Street, NAS, NAS, all the acronyms that, go, that came through on that, uh, that video. But this is uh, really about the brave new world of RMIT. It's about transforming RMIT as a, uh, as a campus from a closed gated community into uh, an open, accessible community and part of Melbourne. Um, and I think that you saw in that, uh, in that video that the project is going to deliver us a series of uh, laneways, 
uh, renovated library, uh, silent study spaces, uh, and repurpose these uh, older buildings that front Swanson Street and move out into the back of, uh, of Bowen Street. Uh, and why? Why are we doing it? Well, first of all, it's going to deliver much better environment for students and staff. Uh, and that's really what it's about. Students have told us that they like the campus, but they, uh, they'd like to spend more time here, but they want the spaces to spend time in. Both social spaces, collaborative workspaces, library, etc. And at the moment, it's not ideally set up for that. Jeremy uh, suggested that I tell you a story about this campus because for, um, I think, my sins of having been here a long time, uh, I can remember some of the history. And when I first came to RMIT, uh, it was really a gated community uh, where uh, the front of Bowen Street was the, the front of the campus. Uh, Swanson Street was really the back door, Latrobe, Latrobe Street and, uh, and Franklin Street were the back door. And there were big gates at either end. Um, so much so that the first, um, <coughs> first Christmas I was here, I had to climb over the gates to, uh, to go into my research laboratory because at that time we had uh, experiments running and no one told me that the university was locked up between Christmas and New Year. It's quite different now. It's a much more accessible campus, but it still looks a bit like Starlink 13 along Swanson Street. So the idea of the, uh, of the NAS project, or New Academic Street project, is to open the campus up, really free it up, um, that there'll be much better access off, uh, off Swanson Street, uh, there'll be better uh, retail space, there'll be better food places. Um, you won't have to go off campus. Um, and it's really creating a new environment for students. A student hall, uh, where there's a concierge model rather than a great long queue or a, you know, stand around and take your number and wait for 30 or 40 minutes. Um, a, much, a much more um, friendly and accessible environment for everyone. Uh, we, we saw last night the first kickoff of this with the, uh, the art that uh, was projected onto the walls of Swanson Street. Uh, and that's really about how do we transform the built environment in which we live here at RMIT. Um, but it's going to be a challenge for us because we've got two things. We've got to run a university and we've got to run a university in the middle of a building site. That's Jeremy's job. And we've got to run a building site in the middle of a university, and that's Marcus's job. Um, so between them as a team, we've got to make sure that we operate. Uh, operate effectively, uh, that people know what's going on, know what's happening, uh, know what some of the, the consequences of new academic street might be. So we have to communicate well, and that's Angela's job, uh, about what we're doing, why we're doing it, but ultimately what it's going to deliver for us. It's going to deliver for us a much better environment to study, work and play in. Um, and it re really, it will transform the services that we've got available. But to do that, there will be a few hiccups along the way. Uh, there's some significant building work that uh, will go on from um, the, uh, the grey buildings back to, to Bowen Street. And Marcus will take you through that this morning. Uh, but with all construction, there's some, there'll be some noise, there'll be some dust, there'll be some inconvenience. Um, come July 2017, it'll all be behind us uh, and we'll, be lip, we'll move into a you know, the brave new world of RMIT and we'll move from built buildings that were built in the 60s and sort of minor modifications into 2015, 2020 style buildings which will create a much better learning and work environment for us all. So 
One of the reasons that we're running these sessions is to make sure that everyone's on the same page about what's happening. To know where to go to to find the information. Uh, to basically to be prepared because um, over the next couple of years there'll be <coughs> batches of students come in each year. Uh, we need to be able to tell them what's happening uh, and make sure that uh, they're not stressed out because, oh, there's something happening in Bowen Street. How do I get from here to here to there. So it's about um, informing everybody and keeping you engaged in the, in the new Academic Street project because you will be both affected and the champions of the, of the project. Um, and the outcomes are that if we're well prepared, that we know what the milestones are going to be, uh, that we know where to go to find frequently asked questions and we know about the facts of the project, then we can all be uh, ambassadors within the university for what New Academic Street will do. Uh, and so this morning's session with Jeremy and Marcus and, and Angela is to make sure that you've got that information and you've also got the navigation skills to go and what's available on the website or you know, someone's just put a big uh, fence up out the front of my uh, front of my building. How, how do I get there? Uh, what's the impact going to be? Thanks, thanks very much for coming. Uh, Any time you need additional information, send us an email to uh, the NAS project uh, email address or to the, uh, through the NAS website, uh, and we'll be able to help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Okay, welcome everyone. For those of you who I haven't met, my name is Angela Martinkus, and I'm managing communications and engagement for the new Academic Street project. Now, I'm part of the team managing, as Peter pointed out before, I'm part of the team managing the impacts of the new Academic Street project outside the hoarding, and that's led by Jeremy Elia, and he's going to be talking to you a bit later in the day, in the morning, I should say. And um, the role of our team, Peter alluded to it, but the role of our team can be summarised into four key objectives. We're maintaining business continuity throughout the life of the project, enhancing student experience throughout the life of the project, taking staff on the NAS journey, and implementing effective communications, change management and campaign activation to support the project. You've probably been touched by our team's work, Wayfinding signage around the campus. We saw the first wave in December. We saw the new wave with the closure of the cafe or the, while we're building the new student hall. Um, we've seen student art decorating hoardings. It'd be great to go down and see the student art if you can, which is on the front of Building 10 um, for the whole of this week and concluding on Monday. Um, we've got monthly staff newsletters We've got the NAS Weekly Bulletin. Has anyone seen the NAS Weekly Bulletin? Hands up. Has anyone seen it? Yeah, we've got that. That's cascading down through the university. That's terrific. And we've also got the NAS website, the public site, and also the staff and students site, which has got a bit more detail about building updates. And we've also got RMIT update articles that we're constantly um, publishing to all staff. So we're working pretty hard within our small team over there in Building 98 to make sure that staff and students know what's happening as we move into the construction phase of the project. Now, Marcus Bailey is the project director managing what's happening inside the hoarding, and he's here today, and he'll be talking about the construction milestones in a minute. Now, Marcus manages a team. Um, Marcus looks after the building contractor lend lease and leads a team of property services, program and project managers to ensure the project is delivered on time and in line with what's been agreed with the builder and the architect's designs. Today we're also joined by our NAS HR lead, Sharon Bush, and our NAS senior safety advisor, Kelvin Hay. And most of us, like I said before, are based in Building 98. We've got a project team working really closely with each other down there. So as part of today's session, I'll summarise what we're going to go through. We're going to be explaining what the construction milestones are that are coming up. We're going to be explaining how it might impact on you as staff members. We're going to explain how we're managing the project and answer your questions and also provide you with the details of who you can call or email if you have any questions further down the track. 
So without any further ado, I'd like to play another video which is going to summarise the timeline. So we might hit the lights and we'll get the show on the road. Morning, my name's Marcus Bailey from Donald Camp What's Cork, uh, Project Manager. So uh, I have been working for the university for about four and a half years. Uh, I assisted in the delivery of the Swanson Academic Building for the College of Business a couple of years ago. Um, what we started on that project, we're, we're really um, ramping up uh, in the delivery of this one. Uh, previous to the Swanson Academic Building, the university used to deliver buildings and then people would move in and then any teething problems would be sorted out. With the Swanson Academic Building um, under the, the eye of uh, Ian Palmer, who is a bit of a change management um, guru, we, we looked at um, a system of strategic user groups and technical project groups to really try and smooth out the transition of completing a building, moving in and then operating. So we, we've been meeting with various technical groups um, over the, with the university over the last probably three years um, in preparation for this project. And it is a very complex project. Um, as Peter Collo said, the intricacies of building in a brownfield site, so it's a renovation, and if any of you have renovated your homes, you'll know what I'm talking about there. It's maintaining business operation, um, and it's trying to minimise the impact on students and staff um, all at the same time. So from a, a, an overall perspective, there's two ways we could deliver this project. One is we could have the builders build it for an hour or so after hours for the next 10 years, or we could let them, you know, decap all the buildings and, and let them build 24 hours a day for a very short period. What we've had to do, they're the two extremes, what we've had to do is try and find a, a sort of middle point there. Um, what, what we've agreed on is that the, the hours of operation for the university are from 8.30 till 6.30, understanding that there's some uh, uh, areas of teaching and learning that happen after those times, but we, we've had to pick those times. So during those hours, uh, we're trying to minimise the amount of work, amount of noise we're doing, but then after hours, that, that's really when the, the bulk of the work gets done, and we'll go through um, some videos explaining how that's going to work. Um, I guess construction milestones I'll go through today. So it's been a long time planning how we're going to actually approach this, um, and we actually had a buildability consultant come on board to assist us in this, and we've had various um, stakeholder group meetings along the way. Um, 
I won't go through the dot points in detail, but the main thrust of the phasing is, is this. We need to build in buildings 10, 12 and 14 from October. So in order to do that, we're providing facilities in building eight, so to allow people to move into that building uh, whilst we, we build phase two. So what we're doing is we're building a temporary student hall in building eight level four, uh, which we opened up in, in October, and everybody will move out of building 12 in, into that area. We've um, done a renovation in building 28, also levels four, five and six, to allow people to move into that area. Um, some have already moved in and some are moving in over the next few weeks. Uh, because we'll be shutting down half the library, and I can see that my friend Steve Gillespie over in the audience there, we're, we're providing upgrades to the library um, as we speak to enable the amount of seats that students can use for, for quiet study space to be pretty much on par with, with what we have at the moment. Um, we're also providing some desks in there which will be final state NAS desks to give students a feel for what, what is coming. So that work's happening at the moment um, and I think the first bit of work that you'll see, we're starting to put some cyclone fencing up down around Casey Plaza so that'll be the first impact that you'll really see. So that work's being undertaken at the moment. The, the second phase of the project is, is really the main phase of the works which will start in October. So from October this year till end of November, early December next year, we'll be doing the bulk of the work. Um, so whilst we say that the NAS project goes for two and a half years, um, it, it re the bulk of the work is really to be delivered by the end of next year. And that is the building 10, 12, 14 areas, which is the retail precinct down in level four, the new student hub down in level four, upgraded library facilities, which is, are gonna be pretty amazing on levels five and six, um, will, will be delivered. What is also going to be delivered for phase one is for semester one next year, this theatre stack that you're in now, which runs up to level 13, we're putting in three angled student portals similar to what we've got at the SAB. So there'll be 400 seats um, for quiet and collaborative learning spaces for the students. So it's, again, it's about some students are only going to be here while there's work going on. So what we don't want to do is have students leave RMIT with a, with a bad taste in their mouth. So, what we're trying to do is, is provide as much good student space as possible during the work and also with the comms team and, and Jeremy's team make, make life interesting for students while they're here. So this is phase two, so first semester to 17, 80% of the project will be finished and able to be utilised by the students. Once that is finished, everybody will move out of building eight and then we start work on building eight, which is the final phase, which is the uh, other half of the level four student areas and also the, the final portion of the, um, the building eight library areas. There's also a garden building you'll see up here in yellow, which is a student um, open space. There's no bookable space. It's called the garden building. It really is a, uh, it's an experimental building of, of ESD. So it's timber constructed. It's got plants coming down the side. I, I think it's mixed mode space. It doesn't have any mechanical um, air conditioning, or if it does, it's very minimal. So, uh, and that will really be a beacon along Bowen Street for student use around the clock. Um, and also, there's a retail area on Building 14, Level 4. So that's really the main thrust of the staging, and we, we think that that's a, a, a good mix of um, early handovers back to the university and trying to minimise the, the amount of area that we're taking offline at, at any one point. So in terms of where we're up to now, we've started work down in building at level four. So you would have seen a hoarding go up there and they're busy um, working after hours on that. So again, we're, we're monitoring the impact on the library on a regular basis. Um, we delivered the Rusu tenancy on Monday over to Rusu Real Foods. So they're gonna be, they're gonna start serving coffee from there, I think from next week. The uh, building tent upgrade, which we're at the moment, we're doing investigations um, hazardous materials reviews, etc., um, and we'll be getting into some soft demolition very soon. Um, and the case in Plaza scaffolding uh, is going up this morning. So we have we have started the project. What's coming up pretty soon is when you're really going to know that we're here. So we're going to start cutting in some slabs um, down in building 10 and 12. Um, this is after the move uh, into the temporary student hall. Um, and we're also going to be start some serious demolition up here. We've also uh, decanted the levels two and three of buildings 10, 12 and 14 
to allow then lease to go in and do some um, hazardous materials and services reviews. We're working really closely with facility services around risk mitigation of cutting fibre, loss of service, all those types of things. So we, we do have a robust set of, uh, of um, principles around how we do the work. If and when we do cut services, the, the idea is that we get them back online as soon as possible and then the communications follow about how, how things run from there. Um, we've had a uh, senior <coughs> university uh, disaster recovery session a couple of weeks ago. Um, it, it's, it's funny, the, uh, the incident that we chose was a, a crane falling down in one of the buildings and that was the Wednesday before the crane fell down at South Bank, so it was quite topical. So it's all geared around getting everybody involved in this process. Uh, and, and that's what it needs. So we've got myself and Jeremy. I'm inside the hoarding and Jeremy's outside the hoarding. And I guess that typifies the university's approach. We need your assistance to, to help us build this thing because it's going to benefit the university overall. We will be listening to you and I'll be working with the builders to, to have the builders work more in line with, um, with, with how the university operates. There is a full-time stakeholder management from Len Lease. His name's Anthony. He's normally here, but he's, he's busy doing some things for me today. If he was here, uh, he would talk about Len Lease. Um, they're used to working in live environments. They've done the children's Royal Children's Hospital project. They work out at the airport, um, and they, they've worked at other universities. So they know what it's like to work in a live environment. Their systems and protocols are set up around that. But there are going to be times when that the friendship between the two is going to be stretched and that's why we've got such a big team to help um, help to manage that. So okay. that's really the, the project from, from my side in, in brief. I could talk for hours and hours. But All right, I'm thank sure you. Don't want me to. Thank you, Marcus. That was terrific. Now we're going to take a look at what this all means for staff and for students who are working and studying close to the construction area. The new Academic Street project will transform the heart of the city campus by creating new facilities that will enable RMIT to deliver better services for students. Over the next two and a half years, the project will upgrade the lower levels of buildings 8, 10, 12 and 14. The enclosed and outdated interiors will be gone, replaced by light-filled learning and social spaces, which will transform how students experience the city campus. But with that change, there may be a few interruptions over the next couple of years, which might be a bit of a distraction. You're probably thinking that working during this time is going to be something like this. Well, don't. We've got plans in place to manage our business through this changing environment. WorkSafe Victoria says permissible noise in the workplace is 85 decibels of noise for 8 hours continuously. What does that mean? Well, it would kind of be like this. Pretty annoying, right? So, to put things into perspective for you, here's some everyday sounds as they relate to actual noise levels. With the new Academic Street Project, Permissible construction noise will be no higher than 65 decibels for longer than 3 minutes in any 15 minute period. Or 70 decibels for a one-off noise, which is less than 3 minutes, between 8.30am and 6.30pm. Got it? Huh? I didn't think so. Basically, it's a lot less than what WorkSafe recommends. So instead of this, it's more like this. Now, outside of work hours, it's going to be a little bit different. WorkSafe Victoria spells out the noise exposure levels and will be complying with those requirements. Permissible noise across the construction zone is 100 dBA for 15 minutes continuously between 6.30pm and 8.30am and weekends, subject to EPA regulations as well. So, after 6.30pm and on the weekends, there could be a bit more noise. So make sure classes are scheduled away from the construction zone or use one of our quieter spaces for study. Now, I guess the key messages that, that struck me as I watched that video is that we are going to be um, implementing measures to keep noise levels at a reasonable level during working hours. 
there will be times when it will spike from time to time, but that will be um, managed in the best way possible in, in terms of Marcus working with, with Len Lease, the builder. Um, but after hours, it's going to be um, a little bit noisier. Now, we do know that we've got... At the end of that video, they showed that room finder service that's available for students where you can um, take a look, go online and you can take a look and you can find a study space somewhere quiet where you can go and work and people can find out what's available. Um, we know that in these buildings, 10, 12 and 14 in particular, there's, there are sort of specialist labs and specialist areas and there are classes scheduled after 6.30 and some of them do, do go later into the evening. So we are sort of mapping the timetable so we can see where those instances are and we're also in the process of working with timetabling to develop a similar type of app so that if you're, you can go online, you can see if any of your classes are going to be held um, after 6.30pm and you can sort of work with your school manager or your head of school if there are going to be impacts and we can also work directly with the builder on, on, on those hotspots, if you will, as well. So that's something that we're doing to manage that. Now, I think Jeremy is going to come up and have a bit of a word and sort of work through and unpack some of those issues, especially around those noise levels as well. Thanks, so Angela. welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, so just to recap the animation um, and what you just saw, um, it's pretty clear that WorkSafe has got clear uh, requirements around decibels um, for safe environments. So, and it was pretty clear in that video that 85 decibels can be maintained up to eight hours. Um, so the simple logic around loud, loud noise is that um, the less sustained it can be um, over a given period. So this slide here, you can see that um, at 80 decibels, it can be sustained for eight hours, which is equivalent to um, a vacuum cleaner. However, at 114 decibels, um, a very loud noise can't be sustained for eight hours. So the, the louder the decibel, basically the less um, that that can be sustained over a period of time. So just remember as well what the video um, highlighted was that what we're targeting is 65 decibels um, up to three minutes in a 15 minute period between 8.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. So another way of looking at it um, on the next slide is um, how this can be played out over, over a period of time. So the sound at 65 decibels is sustained for a, a longer period, three minutes within 15 minute period, and the spikes depict um, a loud one-off noise. And you can also see on the slide that after 6.30, the noise levels can increase up to 100 decibels. Um, so don't forget that uh, out of hours, uh, regardless of the decibel rating, it still does need to comply with WorkSafe and also with EPA regulations. So Marcus did also mention um, Lend Lease and, and their involvement in projects where they've had to maintain um, construction sites within an operational environment. Um, and it's, they're on board because of their expertise in managing that. So obviously the interaction between the project team, Marcus, myself and Lend Lease is going to be important to make sure that we're managing, managing that disruption. So in terms of uh, compliance with regulations, regulations and legislation on the next slide, um, you can see that there is a whole suite of uh, regulations and legislation that we need to comply with, and more in particular with, with land lease. So in all aspects of the construction process, through from planning to the hazmat inspections, isolation of services, through the demolition of construction, land lease have to be 100% compliant with all of those regulations and legislative requirements as well. So what we'll do now is we'll play another video. Um, this video will show um, how we're going to be managing dust, vibrations and fumes um, in the building and then we'll recap that video once it's complete. When we talk about vibration, dust and fumes, I'm sure you're probably picturing something like this. Well, unfortunately, the reality isn't quite as exciting. Vibration impact will be more along these lines. Dust impacts will be less like this and more like this. And fume impacts will be less like this and more like this.
Every decision about the construction of the new academic street has been made with staff and students in mind. If you have any concerns about noise or dust or vibration, contact HR Assist. It will get tracked and a safety advisor will investigate. Remember, we're targeting 65 dBA, which is less than the WorkSafe Victoria standard. We appreciate your patience and cooperation as we deliver the new academic street. Okay, so um, the video that you just saw uh, talked about vibrations, fumes, and also talked about um, uh, the rules of engagement, which I'll talk about shortly. The first thing that I want to just talk about is the environmental monitoring. Um, we'll talk a little bit later just about the way in which you um, can raise issues or concerns where there's a noise um, concern. Uh, but basically, where there is a noise disruptive issue, um, your avenue for raising that concern will be through HR Assist and we'll provide details shortly on that. Um, if it is an as related issue, um, what will happen is that that call from HR Assist will, will be transferred to Kelvin Hay, who's our Senior Health and Safety Advisor on the project. Kelvin has got in his hand an environmental monitoring noise device, so he will effectively use that come on site where the issue is and actually take some readings um, of the disruption and work with both Marcus and with Len Lease to resolve the issue. So obviously if it's above those thresholds, that will need to be addressed. Um, and that's the tool that we will um, use with Len Lease to um, determine if it, if it is an issue. Um, so uh, in terms of vibration, so moving to the next slide, um, with vibration, what, what's important to note um, here, sorry, not the next slide, um, just on vibration, what's important to note around vibration in the building is that um, buildings 10, 12 and 14 um, are concrete encased steel structures. So there's going to be vibration that will transfer up through the building um, and that'll obviously start from the works that are carrying, being carried out on the lower floors. So there's nothing to be concerned about those vibrations. Um, it's basically the nature of the way the, the building's being constructed um, and we do have our engineering, structural engineers who are involved in the project who will regularly come out and actually carry out inspections on as the project proceeds. So in terms of how we're going to reduce the strategies to reducing noise, vibration and dust, um, there's a sequence of things up on the slide there that you can see that will mitigate some of those um, issues. So the first is obviously having full height sound absorbing hoarding around the construction site and in particular within the internal areas. So similar to what you would have seen over the Christmas period and what's actually out down at um, Building 8 on Level 4 at the moment. So that uh, quite robust um, hoarding will be installed around the construction areas. And obviously the high impact operations will be programmed out of hours as we've discussed and in particular over weekends and semester breaks and after school hours. In terms of the external areas there will be shade cloths and water down areas so that will minimise the dust impacts. Uh, there will also be end of shift cleaning that will be carried out um, uh, by Len Lease. And obviously as um, Angela spoke about, the look ahead communications to staff is critical so that we can advise um, staff yourselves about what the impacts of the work's going to be. And as we also talked about, the handheld monitoring devices will be important as well. Another important um, uh, point to talk about is hazmat removal. So with hazmat removal, um, all safety processes will be followed and we do have a full-time resource on the project that's appointed to manage the hazmat program over the life of the project. So in terms of the inspections, you can see on the slide there there's a, a different series of asbestos that, uh, or hazmat material that's likely to be um, apparent in the buildings. Those bottom two are, are the most likely materials that we will see as we're actually carrying out the inspections. Um, and, and you will, at, through the works notices, you will um, understand where and when the monitoring is being carried out and when the removal is actually being carried out as well. So, again, just wanted to highlight that the removal is going to be carefully managed. It'll be done by experienced and accredited personnel. So if you do see any people dressed in protective clothing, um, it's more likely that they're removing uh, the, the more likely uh, hazmat and it's nothing to be uh, concerned about because those accredited personnel are, are following all of the, uh, the requirements in terms of the legislation for removing that material. 
So just moving on to how we're going to manage the project. Um, so the video talked about the rules of engagement. Um, so the rules of engagement is a key document that sits within the builder's contract and it lays out some fundamentals about how we're going to actually uh, run the construction activity while the works are being carried out in a live environment. So um, the video talked about obviously noise and vibration and spelled out some key rules. So we've got some thresholds as you saw around noise and vibration. We've got hours of operation that are called out in the video as well and what's, what constitutes business hours and, and, and normal working hours and out of hours. And then we've also talked about the permissible noise levels and we've also um, mentioned through the comms activities about the weekly um, uh, notification that goes out. So the rules of engagement document actually does require that we do meet with uh, land lease on a weekly basis. That process is important because we sit down with land lease every Thursday and go through with them in detail what works are being carried out and where they're being carried out and what the likely impacts are going to be. That information then gets sent to um, most of you, hopefully, through the weekly bulletins where you can access um, the two weekly look aheads, the works notices, etc., and understand exactly how it's going to impact yourselves. Now, we also capture um, critical university activities by meeting with a number of stakeholders in the university. And we also try and work with those guys to make sure that any works that are being carried out are in line with what events are being carried out as well and there's no issues in terms of the works impacting uh, what events are occurring. Um, obviously and also importantly that the due diligence of uh, the work before any work's being carried out is important. So if there's any um, disconnection of services or isolation of services, that's all been done um, uh, the, the due diligence is being done before any of that work is undertaken. So in terms of issues management process, um, we are effectively going to be adopting what is currently in place within RMIT at the moment. So the current processes that are used is basically what we're going to stick to. Um, the way in which the project office will uh, work with those various existing service centres or help desk areas is by meeting with them on a fortnightly basis and, and, and understanding um, uh, what issues have come through to their areas and uh, how we will actually provide information to them so that they've got a, a good heads up of what issues to expect uh, when issues are raised through their service centre. So obvious issues like noise and disruption will go through a HR assist and obviously that will go through to Kelvin if it's a um, NAS related issue. Um, and you also notice that in your pack that you've got on your seat, uh, if you can pull it out, but in, in your pack you've got this brochure. Um, at the back of the brochure, there is a tearaway, so I can get you to open that up. Um, in that tearaway, there is a, um, a who to call. Um, there's a list of the service centres that, that are available um, for you to contact, depending upon what the issue is. So if we just go through that, so if you've got an issue with, uh, if it's an emergency related issue, obviously security and the contact is there for security. Um, obviously if it is an emergency, you do call triple zero. Um, if it's a pedestrian related issue, there's the security numbers on there. If it's facility related issues in terms of cleaning or water leaks or any amenity related issue, that still goes through to property services. If it's an OHS complaint, as we mentioned, that goes through to HR Assist. If it's a timetabling issue, continue to use the property services timetabling number. If it's an IT related issue, we continue to use the ITS um, service desk. And any library um, concerns, questions or issues, back through to the library um, help desk as well. So, um, as I mentioned, we, when the issue comes through to those service centres, those service centres will transfer the issue through to our team. Depending upon that issue, as I said, if it's a HR, OHS related issue, it will go to Kelvin. If it's a timetable related issue, it will come to myself. Um, we will then work with Marcus and the land lease to work through the issue and get it resolved. So just to um, uh, finalise there, uh, Sharon Bush is going to now take you through um, some points about uh, what to do in particular scenarios. So I'll bring Sharon up to the stand here so she can go through those with you and we'll open up for questions at the end of that discussion. Okay. 
Hi all. Um, I've been working with um, NAS project for a couple of years now, so we're pretty excited to get past planning, I think, and getting moving. Um, we, through the whole planning phase though, we've been thinking about what are the sorts of questions, what are the sorts of disruptions, what are the sorts of concerns people might have as we go through the project. So we've, we've sort of created a bit of a dump of, you know, some of the ones that we thought of, but as Jeremy said, we'll open up to questions um, once we work through these. So firstly, um, one that some of you might be able to relate to, because we're all in a bit of a, I don't know about you, but down at Elizabeth Street, we're affected by building works already, and I know some, um, some of you have probably already been affected as well, so you can well relate to, what if I can't concentrate, what can I do about that, because of noise or disruption or what's going on? So, I mean, in the first instance, as per normal, we would ask that, people, that staff refer back to their manager or their team lead, um, talk about what possible solutions there might be. It will depend on what phase you're in and how long is the, the disruption going to last for, of course. Um, there may be some options around alternative workspace that can be explored, but also um, I know people in my area tend to like using noise cancelling headphones and other things like that. So there's different ways that that can be approached. Um, if you're wanting more advice about that, I think HR Assistant Health and Safety can also assist with that as well. What else have we got? So if I'm worried about dust, um, we know that um, you know some of these things can be quite concerning for people, particularly if they've got particular health concerns. And of course, we'd always expect people to you know, you, you know your health best and, and um, to work with medical advice as needed. But again, with anything that's um, concerning people about health and safety, please come through to HR Assist and we'll get you um, that tailored advice as well. Okay, and the next one. What if I'm worried about my colleagues' welfare? That could often be a concern too. The same sort of advice, of course, would apply. So obviously encourage people if they've got concerns or if they're feeling anxious of, about their health and what's going on, they can contact HR Assist for specific advice. Um, but you can also contact them if you need, if there's something going on in your area and if you need them to come out and assist with that. What if it takes me longer to get where I'm going? Well, that can happen. So I think there's been some discussion already about um, I think Peter mentioned it, Mark's mentioned it, you've mentioned it, you know, the, the wayfinding, it, things will change. As the project progresses, it's not static, it's going for two years. Um, the environment will continue to change through the different phases of the project, which means that some areas will get shut off, some areas, you know, there'll be detours for how you get around <coughs> the campus. So that means we need to keep up to date with what's going on. There's um, <coughs> a lot of work going on, particularly led by Angela, in terms of making sure that the messages are constantly being pushed out um, and that the NAS website is up to date about what's the work coming ahead and there's the two week look aheads. So that can give you advice about what's, you know, what's current and what's about to happen. So you may need to plan ahead a bit when you're getting around campus. Um, sorry, what else did we have? What if I'm worried about dust and its impact on my health? I already said no, that one. Yeah. <laughs> what do I tell students if they complain about the works? Um, the communication strategy that's been prepared is really based on a principle that we want to make sure that the staff have all the information because we know that um, other staff are going to turn to you and students will also turn to you saying what's going on and how do I, you know, how do I deal with this? So. If um, there are concerns coming from students, again, you've got all the information about where to get help and where to get information for them. The student hubs will also um, be briefed and they'll have, um, be up to date as well. The sort of complaints we, we would anticipate, I guess, around the works may be um, around how do I access um, you know, where I would normally go to or if it's taking longer to get places. And there'll be a lot of signage around that as well. But if there's more signage or um, something that could simply be done to, to try and make that easier, please contact NAS Project Office and they'll get onto that. Um, other complaints that we'd expect from students is they're trying to study um, noise during teaching. You know, if, if that's distracting, how do we deal with that? And the project team has been working with timetabling to try and make sure 
that um, the works and the teaching spaces are sort of aligned to lessen that impact as much as possible. But also, as Angela said, there's the Room Finder app or the Room Finder <coughs> website where people can find alternative spaces to go to that may be a bit quieter. Um, and there's also, I guess, just also about how do you keep up to date with what's going on? And I might throw to Angela yep. around that. Okay, no worries. So a lot of people have mentioned the um, weekly bulletin. Now, the weekly bulletin is sent to probably getting close to around 700 people um, to, across the campus every Friday. Um, it, it consistently, we try and send it out around the same time so you guys can anticipate when it will arrive, you can take a look at it, you can, it, you can read it and you can plan your week accordingly um, and discuss issues that that, that that bulletin may arise, that, that may be raised for you. So. Um, We've made it as simple as possible. Um, it's divided up by building, and each building has a link to a works notice or a link to a two-week look ahead. So we've tried to make it as easy as we can for people to digest what's going to be quite a lot of information. Um, if, you, if you receive it, you should be cascading it to people within your teams. We have been um, working with school managers in particular and asking school managers, particularly in SEH, which is in the affected areas, to be cascading that information down through their schools. And there also could need to be a discussion between key people within your school about whether you need to be doing some um, proactive information to share with students, like, you know, do you need to put up some signs this week? Do you need to um, send an email to students? once a semester advising them that there's going to be some impacts. So we're really encouraging people to try, try and be proactive and interact with that information as much as they possibly can. We have templates in the project office and we also have you know, comms people who can help you and give you advice. So we'd really encourage you to contact us. Um, follow the escalation process, the processes that have already been explained. Now, the last thing you need when there's an issue is an email spraying out to um, you know, a whole host of people across the university, that just makes a lot of rework for people, like we've got processes in place and the right people to manage the right situations. And um, like I said, I've already mentioned, we, you know, create posters and update students as much as we possibly can. Sometimes it's good for students just to get messages in their face just in time. So um, posters are a terrific way to do that. And we're also working with the student group on some um, mass communication, direct communication to students um, in the form of an electronic direct mail email. So we're doing that as well. So um, at this juncture, maybe it would be good to pause and stop talking and give you guys a chance to, to ask us questions and um, we can do our best to answer them for you. So over to you guys.